Welcome everyone, this is the War Simmer, and today we're going to be going through a full tutorial in VR for the LES Saab 340A. It's a regional prop and a good one to start on if you're just getting into commercial aircraft for X-Plane, because it's relatively simple when it comes to fulfilling that role, but it is still commercial. The goal here is to provide you with a comprehensive but concise walkthrough that covers all the bases for someone inexperienced, but will hopefully still allow you to come out with an understanding of what you're actually doing, rather than just following a list. I feel like sometimes tutorials fall into that trap and I want to avoid it. We're going to follow a Sid and Star route, so if you aren't familiar with that, check that off your list. You're going to understand it after this flight. And I want to warn you that I'm not an expert by any means, but I'm going to check that as a positive for newcomers. We'll be able to relate to common issues and questions that maybe a more experienced simmer might not think about. There will be timestamps in the description as well as a link to the checklist I use and links to the plugins I use. Quick note, you will need the SimVR Labs profile to fly this bad boy in VR but it's an easy setup and the Saab feels like it's native VR once you do it. So when you step outside of the Saab, you'll see that you'll have the pitot covers and chocks on the wheels. I went ahead and removed them beforehand, but you can see how you can just remove them here with your touch controls. We'll move over here and the first thing you want to do is attach the external GPU unit. That gives power to the aircraft before you get the engines running. Uh, well, I put that chalk back on. Let me go ahead and remove that. I don't know if you'll be able to see it, but I'm going to lean over here, and there's a little green box that'll pop up. If you go ahead and click it with your touch controller, you'll see the GPU attach. So now we have power. Um, before we get the engines running, we can go ahead and step into the aircraft. I'm going to go through some of our plugins first. The first thing I'm going to have loaded is the actual checklist. It's just a text file you can load via the U, uh, VR menu. And I like to have that loaded even though I use multi-crew experience. I have a first officer talking to me because I can just visually reference this. And also, if you don't want to pay for that plugin, you can just reference this checklist yourself as you're going through it. You can see right here, there's the pre-flight checklist. That's where we're going to start. I have a checklist before that you can run through too if you want. Here is Passengers FX. Now, there's two editions of Passengers FX. There's the Basic Edition and the American Edition. And the Basic Edition is free, and I highly recommend this plugin. Um, the Basic really covers everything the American Edition does. There's a few things you can't run if you only have the basic edition, the ones with the asterisks um, you can see right here. But basically it's just an immersive plugin that allows you to uh, do pilot to crew announcements, crew to passenger announcements, and it just, it just provides that, that extra step of immersion. OSVR is the other plugin I'm looking at right now, and it's a way for you to adjust the super sampling and the um, ASW on the fly. It's great because if you have any problems with your frame rate, you can just downsample. Um, your, uh, your super sampling on the rift and it just lets you go on the fly. You don't have to exit out and go back in. And finally, the plugin that's essential for VR is Abitab. Um, you can see right here all the different options you have to navigate this. Uh, it's like a tablet. You can go into your charts and as long as you have a PDF file, um, you can grab those from something like Sky Vector. You can set up your nav logs, your airport diagrams, star charts, SID, route, SID routes, uh, I even uh, converted a de-icing chart that was a ping file, and it's just a really essential reference uh, uh, tool to have. You can look up your airports, um, so we'll go ahead and type in KSDF, which is uh, our departure airport, Louisville. It gives you the elevation of the airport, all your frequencies, um, it even has runway information, ILS frequencies, your courses, I mean, it's just an awesome tool. Um, you have to have this if you want to fly in VR and not have to constantly go out to um, Oculus Desktop. So we'll go ahead and search our destination airport, Kilo Brava November Alpha, that's Nashville. And um, also, uh, Abitab has, uh, it's got maps, a real-time map. It even has details with the airport you're at. You can see the individual runways, uh, where you're at as far as your, um, your gate. Um, you have a note section where you can write down any notes. You want to doodle, set altimeter settings, just things like that. I mean, I can't say enough about this plugin. I could not play VR without AviTab. There's a Navigraph um, option as well. I don't have Navigraph, but it's there if you do have it. So let's go ahead and get this rolling. There's a few things I have to set up with MCE. I know most of you really aren't concerned with that, so I'm just going to skip ahead and we'll start our pre-flight. Hi, Captain. How are you? The checklist is about to start. Pre-flight checklist, search arrival and destination port via Avitab. Okay, so we've already searched our airports via Avitab. Gust lock off. We'll want to turn off our gust locks first, and by default they are off. There are these two knobs right here, and they lock the control surfaces. 
Now we'll want to go ahead and turn on our left and our right battery, which is the internal battery for the airplane. We're going to turn on the external power, which is going to draw power from that GPU instead. Now I'll pause that. I want to give a quick note. If you look at this, um, the left and right battery switches, you'll see there's an override switch. Now what that is, is let's say that you weren't relying on your external power. You have about 10 minutes worth of internal battery. Now there's, an hydro there's a hydraulic pump that needs to pump the hydraulics through the aircraft to work things like the gear. And if you have it on override, uh, it will go ahead and pump that, uh, those hydraulics, even if you don't have the external power on. Now, because you do have the external power on, it's going to go ahead and pump the hydraulics regardless. But let's say you were in a pinch, you didn't have the GPU, be sure to set it onto override until the hydraulics finish pumping through. And you can definitely hear them. You'll hear them here in a second. People hate it. It just sounds like a horrendous screech, like a woman dying. But you'll, you'll definitely know when it's running and when it's done running. Master caution warnings. Okay, we can go ahead and turn off our master ca caution warning lights. Beacon and we'll start by turning our beacon light on. That's the first external light you always turn on on any aircraft. On and we'll follow with the rest of our um, external lights, except for the taxi and the landing lights, because we don't want to blind the pushback guy. Go ahead and flip on our three avionics. And what that does is it allows us to access our navigation systems. And we'll pull up the oxygen knob over here which is on the uh, first officer's right armrest, and we'll push down this tiller knob. Just press right there in the center and push down. And that acts kind of like a nose wheel. It unlocks the nose wheel so you can uh, turn via your rudders when you're taxiing. That's where the dome light is, but it's not active. Uh, we don't need it during the day. We'll turn this knob right here, which turns on the lights for our center panel. And this knob right here that I'm turning does your left instrument panel. You can see those light up. Welcome passengers aboard. Now here's an opportunity to use passenger FX. We'll go ahead and welcome the passengers aboard. Give you an idea of that kind of immersion you can get with this plug-in. I really enjoy it. Garmin knob. We'll turn on our Garmin, which is our main navigational system. Go to this top knob, turn it all the way right. Give it a second to load up. Also, you want to check your nav radio. I don't know if you can see it, but it's set to on by default, so you don't have to worry about it. And we use that to uh, tune into a frequency to land on a specific runway. It's called an ILS approach, and we'll get into that later. Here's our two comm radios. You have two of them in the Saab. Um, the active channel is the one that's lit up. You can flip between the active and the reserve with that flip or, or with that switch right there. And if you want to change the channel, you just rotate those knobs, and then you can flip it up to active. So we'll set our second comm to the Addis departure port. And the Addis is just a way for us to determine what runway we're going to take off from and give us weather uh, weather reports like the wind, um, okay. cloud levels, etc. So we're going to go ahead and set COM2 so we can get that ADIS report. We want to make sure we know what runway we're going to take off of as well. And we'll set our first COM2 delivery. We're not going to use ATC, but we'll just set it anyways. Now those two dials I just turned up are our volume, so you can hear our ADIS coming in now that we have it tuned. So we have good weather. We're going to record our altimeter first. Altimeter two nine nine two. Check so that's 2992, and that is a way to determine, uh, basically to get an accurate altitude. It takes the air pressure, and you have to you put that into your altimeter to make sure your altitude's correct. Our two takeoff runways were 11 and 35 left, and kilo was our information uh, letter that we would give to uh, departure, just to let them know we read the ADIS report. Resuming checklist. Read and notes at report. Go ahead and turn on our uh, Garmin. And, gentlemen, to to on and now that we have our information for our um, departure airport, we can go ahead and switch COM2 to our um, arrival ATIS frequency, 135.1. And that'll just, uh, when we get in range, it'll just allow us to find out which runways are active, and we can set that up to uh, our nav radio when we do the ILS approach. And I'll get into that uh, when, we, when we come up to it. Don't worry about it right now. So right now we're going to go ahead and load our flight plan on the Garmin. I'll zoom in here so you can see it a little better. If you hit this FPL button right here, you'll see there's a flight plan already loaded. If you hit menu and then twirl that big knob down to delete, you can hit enter again and delete it. And then to load a new flight plan, you'll see on that knob, come to the outer part of the knob, the thin one, and turn it to the next page. Then press that in and you can just scroll over and we're going to do uh, KSDF and KBNA2. That's the flight plan that we have for today. And you'll see it just loads right up. Zoom back in some, and, and it'll give you an idea of our flight plan of our path. I carry on with the all important checklist. Load flight plan via GPS. And we just did that. Contact delivery. 
Request clearance. And again, we're not using ATC, but we would just ask delivery for clearance to go ahead and depart at that point. Sex squawk. Now your squawk or your transponder is right here. It's the radio on the bottom left. I'm just going to assign a random number. And I forgot to do this. Uh, it's actually off by default, so you'd want to turn that little knob on the left to on to make sure it's set, and ATC can follow you. Your squat code is a way for you to be identified. And those were the smoking and the seatbelt signs I just turned on, and turning those two knobs is the AC. Put them up vertical. And we'll check here. Your fuel gauge is right here, so we have fuel. There's your hydraulic pressure. It's in the green. It's good. And that's your trim. And trim is for, like, your pitch, uh, your roll, and your yaw. Right here is how you would actually adjust your pitch. Here's your roll. And right over here is your yaw, your rudder. And that's just basically a way to, to stabilize yourself in flight. You don't need to use them much on commercial airlines. They stay pretty stable um, regardless. And it's done by autopilot most of the time. Cabin pressure auto right there. Prop sync off. You want to have cabin pressure on auto for sure because once you get above 10,000 feet, you get a lot of light heads if you uh, did not have that on auto. Now again, 35 left is going to be our uh, departure runway. We had the choice between that and number 11, and 35 left is just a little bit longer of a runway. So I'll go ahead and load up our SID, which is our departure. It's a standard instrument departure. So we'll go ahead and change our frequency to ground on COM1. Yep. I'm just going to run through these final parts of the checklist with the uh, MCE first officer because I'm going to explain to you uh, a little bit more about the SID chart and, and how I might have to change the flight plan because we do have a flight plan in the Garmin already, but plans change. If you actually look at our SID, our departure, you know we're runway 35 left, and you can determine what runway that is just by looking at the uh, position on the chart. So you see this runway here on the left that's facing up at about 350 degrees. That corresponds to the 35. Runways are named according to their direction they're facing. 35, 350 degrees. You see that first waypoint was row. So we come and check our flight plan again, and you can see the first waypoint on the flight plan is Gatson. So that's incorrect. That's going to put us on that other runway. That runway that, uh, let's go back and look at it, I think was facing west. Yeah, Gatson. And I just, oh, also I want you to know, see this Cargo 3 departure, the name of our SID? You can always find the name of the SID by looking at that last waypoint where all the waypoints converge. And that's the cargo waypoint, as you can see. But there's Gatson right there. We want to be on row, the runway that's uh, the first waypoint for runway 35 left. So if you go back to, um, you go to PROC, Procedures, right here. You can see all these options. If you select uh, select departure and hit enter, we want to do that cargo three SID because that's the SID where you were working off of. You hit enter, and we just change the runway. So we go down to 35 left, enter to select it, and hit enter again to load. And you'll see now there's RROE, our first waypoint, then Bubba, then cargo. Now you also notice though the old waypoints are still in there. So we uh, push down on the knob, scroll down, and we'll just hit clear enter clear inner and clear inner inner for cargo the last cargo waypoint that was uh, duplicated and we can just go back out to our flight plan and we have the correct flight plan in so if you look here you'll see that intermediary waypoint INTC it's tracking at 244 and what I'm going to do is the center knob right here is the heading bug we're going to try to line that up to that same direction 243 Let's go ahead and catch up on our text checklist. We're at the engine start. Uh, we took care of yeah, we reading the checklist. Right, Captain, engine start checklist. Heading bug set to first waypoint. And again, our heading bug is already set to that first waypoint that I looked at. Right there, that little pink bug that we turn with that middle heading knob. Emergency light on. We want to arm our emergency light. There's a guard preventing you from switching it to on by accident. Auto and, on. and we want to turn on our auto course and, and our standby pedo. Now I'll get into what auto course and is um, once we get start. flying. And now we can actually start our left engine. These are called your uh, prop levers or your condition levers. 
you push that left one up right to where it catches and stop and then you flip that left switch right there for a second and release it and that'll start the engine uh, you'll see right here that yellow L engine thing is lit up L engine panel and when that finishes lighting up it means the engine has started and we just started on the left engine because the GPU was on the right so we'll give that a second to go ahead and get started and there it is started so now we have power and we can go ahead and remove that external GPU so we'll step out and we'll go ahead and uh, just click on it with our touch controller and detach it we also want to make sure to actually turn off the external power switch so the plane no longer tries to draw power from the GPU and instead does it internally so we've got that done right engine start. and we can go ahead and do this with the right engine as well we'll move that condition lever up and you'll feel it catch right there release it and then we'll flip for the right switch release it and the right engine will do the same thing when you are ready skipper right engine start go ahead and go to our nav log and we'll look at the airport left and right generators reset and on and you can see we're actually starting well, let me go ahead and get these generators reset. Flip it to the on position, reset the left, on, and reset the right. Our generators are good to go. Just be sure you reset them before you... Don't just put them on on, reset. reset. And then we'll go ahead and reset our bleed valves as well. And you'll see those yellow uh, warning lights will go off. So now our AC is going to work. Main and we'll IMV switch off shot. on the uh, main INV. So now we have power to everything on the aircraft. That's your panel light for your overhead panel. You saw our lights go up. Here's your floodlight if you need it. We don't. But just to show you, you turn that knob and it gives you some floodlight. Turn that back off. Now we're not going to have to de-ice the aircraft, but this is where you would do it at this point if you did. But you can see it's 14 degrees Celsius. If you look at our nav log right there, and um, up here in this upper left quadrant of the uh, overhead panel is your de-icing. Overhead panel check. And we're just going to check our overhead panel. Those yellow warning lights right there and right there should be the only ones on at this point. Dashboard warning now we'll check our dashboard warning panel. And the only thing lit up is the parking brake because we still have our parking brake on. Engine start checklist. And so now our engine start checklist is complete we can go ahead and go to our pushback now I use a plugin called better pushback it's another free plugin you can go ahead and pre-plan your pushback which I did before we started this video but um, if you want to use the uh, default pushback that comes with X plane 11 you're free to do that but we'll go ahead and get that started great news captain your toes coming here comes our man the RO button pushed. Right through the building. Excellent. Good collision detection on X-Plane, guys. And I'm just pressing that bearing button. You can see on the nav display that purple line uh, disappears. And it's just a way to keep us from being distracted. We don't need to use that during this flight. And now we just switch to GPS mode by hitting CDI right there. And you can see it says LRN1 in the nav display. Make sure it says that because when we use our autopilot, you can see me flipping it back and forth. When we're on GPS mode, it's going to follow our GPS waypoints and not that radio frequency, not that 116.75. Still waiting for your reply, Skipper. CDI switch from localizer to GPS mode. Check display LRN1. Calibrate right. airspeed Looks indicator. Like the doors and hatches are Calibrate our airspeed back. indicator. You can just press in on that knob right there and hold it. Make sure everything aligns okay and release it when you're done. Southwest 1606, monitor tower on 35.3 good day. Altitude. Now we're going to set our altitude. On a regional like this, 20,000, flight level 200 is a good altitude to be at. I'm going to go ahead and release my parking brake so we can uh, get pushed back. But 20,000 is a good altitude to be at. You can just tr turn this knob until you hit it. And again, that's flight level 200. If you hear flight levels like flight level 150, that means 15,000. Flight level 100 is 10,000 and so on. Now we're going to set our autopilot. We're going to hit nav. And nav allows us to follow that GPS route that's on our Garmin. And climb, it just sets our climb rate. It means that we're going to climb to 20,000. And there's that LRN1 again to make sure we're following GPS and not the uh, radio frequency. I'll hit climb, and I can cycle that. You'll see over here there's this little white bug in the bottom right around your 4 or 5 o'clock. 
and that moves every time you press it. And I'll get into detail on what that is in just a second. But you want to set it to about 140. You want that bug about as low as it can get, uh, but keep it above your stalling speed, which is around 115. Pitch trim reset or set within green. Make sure our pitch trim is set for takeoff. Make sure those lines are in the green, which they are. And we just want to make sure that trim's set there so it gives us enough lift. Um, it's going to catch that air and let us take off at a lower speed. And our wind is calm, which is great for takeoff, but I'm going to go ahead and pause it for just a second. Um, I want to describe the way that wind and crosswind affects your aircraft as you're taking off, because it kind of seems, it's kind of counterintuitive the way it works. I'll even put a diagram up here on the screen. Now, uh, this is not the runway heading we're taking off at. If you remember, we're taking off um, 35 left, but let's say that we were taking off perfectly north, so we're taking off right at 360, as you can see on this diagram. And the wind, let's say the wind is coming at uh, 270 degrees. It's coming from 270 degrees, so it's blowing left to right across your aircraft as you're taking off. That's called a crosswind, when the wind is blowing directly across you. Now, if a wind is coming directly towards you, that's a headwind. Behind you is a, it's coming from behind you is a tailwind. And when you're landing, the best way to land is via a headwind, because you have air uh, flying towards your face as you're flying, and it generates extra lift. Like, if you ever see bush landings, when you see those planes land, when they're just going like, it looks like they're basically standing still in the air and just coming down like a helicopter landing. It's because that headwind is pushing to that aircraft so strongly that all that wind's generating lift, even though it's not really moving across the ground. The ground speed isn't really anything at all. And that's how they can land in those, in those tight little crannies when you're doing bush piloting. But when you have a crosswind, that's, that's when difficulties arrive, especially with taking off. So like in our example, let's say that wind again is coming from, uh, 270 degrees and let's say it's going at 10 knots so it's you know it's, it's not unmanageable but it's kind of high blowing left to right across your aircraft now what you would think intuitively was is okay i need to counter that wind i'm going to go ahead and push left on my rudder and fight into that wind so i don't get blown right across the runway it's actually not the way it works because what happens is the way i'm assuming it's because the way your plane is balanced it's going to actually push your tail to the right and not the entire aircraft all at once which means your nose is going to start pointing left into the direction the wind is blowing you. So make sure when you hear those wind reports, you do the opposite of what seems intuitive. You, let's say that wind's blowing left to right. You think you need to push left rudder to counteract it. Actually, you want to use right rudder and actually turn your rudder towards the, uh, the direction the wind is blowing. You'd want to turn it right in this example. So just remember that. And I think that happens because your, your tail is what gets pushed when the wind is blowing it across. But that just applies for... Uh, for takeoffs and or when you're on the ground when you're actually flying and you're coming into a crosswind to land you do want to push into the wind at the last second but we won't get into that right now that's that's a little bit more complex and this is just a basic tutorial but i did think it was worth noting so we can go ahead and get on with uh, the rest of this tutorial okay so we're about ready for the taxi checklist as soon as the tug disconnects push back checklist complete so just to get a little more into this uh, speed bug on your airspeed indicator, you can see right now it's set at 140, which is the slowest you can set it at when you cycle through the climb autopilot. And the way that works is, let's say that, um, let me go ahead and release the park, or set the parking brake so we can get disconnected. The way that works is, um, let's say it was set at 180. What that means is your uh, autopilot is going to wait till you get 180 knots before it starts diverting the rest of the unused energy to your climb. So if you look at your vertical speed indicator, which is right here, point to it, you see it might be a slower climb. It might only be like 1,000 feet a minute instead of 2,000 if you were going 140. So generally you want to set that uh, as low as you can before stall, just so you can make sure that um, your vertical speed is going to be sufficient to get you to your altitude. Now we're taking off from this terminal right here to begin our taxi, so we're going to come down. Let's zoom in just a little bit. We're just going to go straight ahead and then hang a left on Bravo. We're going to cross runway 11, continue down Bravo all the way to 35 left, and we're just going to take off from that point. Uh, normally ATC would give you directions, but we're not going to worry about that. We're not using ATC, so we're just going to uh, take that taxiway ourselves. Landing lights on. Go ahead and turn our landing lights and our taxi lights on now that the tug is out of the way. And now we're going to set our um, CTOT. We're going to turn that on right there and we'll go ahead and set it to about 100. And what that is, basically, think of it as a, as a type of toga for prop planes. It affects the torque of your propeller. 
So we're going to push up our uh, condition lever to the next catch, wait 10 seconds, and the reason for, is, for that is you'll see the props go ahead and rev up, you'll see that red light come on, and then you'll see it dissipate. We can go ahead and push it up to the very next catch. Now take mind that max is not pushed up as far as it can. If there's a catch right before it, that's where you want to be. And we'll go ahead and I just put the flaps down, one. I don't know if you can hear it in the background, but there is um, one of the uh, flight attendants giving a briefing to the passengers. Just uh, It's an automated thing from passenger FX whenever you set your flaps. So we'll go ahead and start our taxi. Let's get caught up on our checklist here. Taxi checklist is complete, Captain. Got a FedEx terminal over there to our left. Let's go ahead and get lined up on this center line here. And I like to keep a ground speed of about 10 to 15, so we can speed up just a little bit, um, especially if you're going straight away. If you have some turns, you might want to cut it back to about 10, but a ground speed of 10 to 15 is sufficient. Right now we're passing Charlie, so if we hung a left here, it would be Charlie. Right up here will be Bravo. I don't know if you can see the sign. And this is the intersection for runway 11. Now normally you would stop or make sure you had clearance from ATC to pass it, but we're not going to worry about it. Just go straight through. Speed up just a little bit. It's a long way to the end of Bravo. You can see that ground speed on the nav display in teal. So we're going really fast, but again, it's just a straightaway all the way down the runway. So we'll go ahead and start our takeoff checklist. Contact ground. Inform holding point location. Receive handoff to tower. And normally before you get to the runway, uh, ground will give you a handoff to the tower. So we'll just switch our comm to tower. VHF set to tower. Prop lever max. CTOT. And now we're just checking we're configured for takeoff. Our prop lever is at max. CTOTs are on, set to 100. Auto course and light check. Takeoff and Auto course is on. Our lights are on correctly. And then we have an option of, of going from ground operation to takeoff inhibit, and I'll go ahead and select that right now. And what takeoff inhibit does is it just um, nullifies any warnings you may get on takeoff that would distract you that weren't major warnings, like if you were uh, improperly configured. It's just a way to minimize distractions. Make sure we're in nav and climb mode, and that we're following GPS, LRN1, on the nav display. And now we're checking our top console, and you can see there are no warning lights. So we're looking pretty good to go here right now. Okay, so we just want to make sure we're on the proper runway. 35 left, so we should be bearing about 350 degrees. So let me turn on here, we can check that out. And we look good to go. Hey, perhaps 
you need more time. No props. Runway heading check. Prepare immediate retraction of flaps and gear. And always remember, as soon as you rotate off the runway to retract those flaps, push them up, put the gear up. It's really easy to forget sometimes. Manual flight until heading line up. Ready climbing checklist. Take off checklist is complete. So now we'll go ahead and begin to throttle up. And you want to push the throttle up to the very start of that top line. You'll be able to see it right here. Right there is a good point to throttle up to. Now, as we head down the runway, I have this first officer doing callouts for me. V1 will be the first call out, and that is the speed that you're going before you can abort takeoff. When you get to VR, that's your rotation speed, the speed you actually take off. And V2 is the minimum speed required to take off with only one engine. And again, this is variable depending on passenger load, etc. Uh, I, this isn't accurate what I have mine set at. I have mine set at 115 for V1 and rotation speed at 120. So now we'll go ahead and pull back lightly on the yoke. Get a positive rate. Then we can check that heading bug and see that we're pretty much heading the direction we need to go. Put the flaps up, gear up. Looking good. Go ahead and engage the autopilot. And I'll show you later how to do that. And you can check we're following GPS mode via nav. So we're just going to follow those waypoints straight ahead. And, and again, right now, we're totally on autopilot, heading to row, going to 20,000 feet via climb. And you can see now that we've hit that 140 mark, the rest is going to be diverted to our vertical speed, to our climb. So we're getting a vertical speed of about 2,000 feet per minute right now. Let's go ahead with the climbing checklist. Yep, let's rock. Captain, climbing checklist. Com 1 to departure of flight level 20. Switch the com over to departure. We're at flight level 35 right now. VHF is set to departure. Got that. Contact and provide current altitude. Provide inbound way. So we tell ATC we're at flight level 40 and we're inbound to row. Instructions. And we'll just continue to follow our waypoints. We can go ahead and turn off auto course now. And turn on the prop sync. And prop sync really is just a way to sync the propellers to uh, provide comfort to passengers. Manage our seat tot. You can see that red light on our oil's hot, so we're going to dial back on that seat tot a little bit to about 80, and you can see the oil cool to a reasonable range. You don't want to overheat those props. We can turn off our taxi and our landing lights. Keep the others on. And now we'll switch over to center on COM1. Now you may be wondering, it's, I'm not actually going in and dialing the frequencies to go to all these ATC channels. That's because I have a first officer uh, with MCE. Now if you didn't have that, you could just go ahead and change those knobs manually and flip them. Now I am keeping my seat tots on. I'm not turning them off. Some people will tell you to turn them off and climb, but I like to maintain that extra power to maintain that good vertical speed of about 2,000 feet per minute. Because if you were to cut back on that seat tot or even turn it off, your vertical speed's going to suffer. You might drop down to only 1,000 feet per minute climb, and uh, we got to get to 20,000, so we've got a ways to go. I like to keep that on and just keep it cool enough to where uh, the oil light doesn't come on. At least to the climb. After the climb, you want to turn it off. Now, I'm going to move on to that auto Corson. Uh, I was really confused about what auto Corson was when I first started flying the Saab. Uh, if you look, you'll see that we are in a prop plane. And basically, auto Corson is an automatic feathering of the props if your engine failed. So, like, if you look, uh, let's use my touch controller. When your props are spinning through the air, cutting through the air, and providing you power, they're facing in a, in a manner where they produce a lot of drag. You're, it's got a lot of wind resistance, 
And if your engines were to fail, the auto coursing is going to slowly rotate your actual propeller, propellers excuse me, until they're in a position where they're going to slice through the air rather than hit the air head on. And it's going to give you valuable time if you were in an emergency situation to glide for a longer distance. You can see right now our heading's turning to match the desired track right here. Doing that automatically because we're following GPS navigation and we're just going to stay on that pink line to cargo, which is the final point on our um, SID departure route. So we'll go ahead and we'll check out that departure route. Get out of this. Here's our SID. Just to go briefly over this, I'm going to go over our star chart as well, but here's some of your frequencies for the uh, airport, for Louisville Airport that we just departed on. Here's some notes you want to take note of, and as you can see, this is for turbojets only, not for props. Top altitude's 5,000, so we're not following this chart exactly at all, but if you wanted to go by the book, just be aware of stuff like that on the, on the SID chart. Here's further detail down here about each individual runway, as far as your headings, what waypoints, etc. But you can also read it up here just by looking at the chart. Let's see. Some of the things. We went over the runway heading. You can see that you come out 350. We're at runway 35. The degrees go to 335 until row and then Bubba. And that's where we're at right now. We're going from Bubba to cargo. And we're going at 221 degrees. And that 27 right there in parentheses, that is your distance. It's 27 nautical miles to uh, cargo. Right here is your altitude. That's 1,020 or higher because there's a line underneath. If the line was above, it would be 1,020 or lower. So if you were taking off from 35 right, you'd want to be at that altitude or 17. Um, or if you're taking off from runway 17, which is just the opposite of, of the 35 runway. Let's see. Good view. And there you have it. We'll go ahead and continue our climb, and once we reach our cruise altitude of 20,000, we'll start the second part of the video. We'll, we'll go through the cruise checklist following the star chart for our arrival, and we'll go through the ILS approach, landing, shutdown, and the rest of all that jazz.